Okay, guys, um, welcome to the webinar this evening. Uh, my name's John West. I'm from uh, Altitude Ski School. Um, I'm lucky enough to be joined this evening um, by a fantastic panel. We've got um, John Faulkner um, that you guys can hopefully all see. Give us a wave, John. You can, uh, so John's an experienced mountain guide. He's, he's, um, he's famous for lots of things around here, I think. Uh, his music, telemarking. Jumping out of um, jumping out of helicopters in Bond movies. Have you done that recently, John? Was, uh... um, <laughs> mo most of that stuff happened last century. <laughs> so just to put it into perspective. Okay, uh, we've we've also got um, Sasha here as well. Sasha um, is at the bottom of my screen, but I'm not sure if you can you can see if you can give us a wave, Sasha. Um, Sasha's a mountain guide as well, local mountain guide. He also runs the Ferris Cheval restaurant in Verbier which we all, we all love to, to eat in and drink in. Um, we've also got Xavier de la Rue, doesn't really need an introduction. Um, three times Free Rod World Tour champion, um, living in Verbier is known by, um, I think pretty much everybody here. Um, thank you for joining us, Xavier. You can give us a wave as well, if you like. <laughs> there he is. Um, we've also got Andre, he's competed in the Free Rod World Tour. Uh, he's a federal qualified instructor and he runs his own snowboard school in Verbier called Independent Snowboarding. He's, he's there, he's got a picture of himself in the background as well. Lovely turn there. Um, no and we've got, thanks mate, and we've got David as well. David's in the middle giving us a wave. David actually works in our office, um, and, but he's, uh, he's a passionate snowboarder, um, but he, he also does um, base jumping and um, he's here to, um, to help me a little bit with the questions later on. Um, but also he's going to do a little presentation about um, about confidence and experience and how that can affect um, the risks that we take. Um, and it's very relevant because David does a lot of base jumping, he actually trains people to um, to learn to base jump. Um, so he's, there's a lot of similarities in, in decision making and things. So he's going to he's going to tell us all about that later. Um, fantastic. Guys, thank you for um, for joining us tonight. I think everyone really appreciates it. And you can tell by the big turnout this evening. Um, on a Monday night. I mean, there's not a lot to do on a Monday night, but we've, you know, I think we've, we've pulled in a good audience here. So it's, it's great stuff. Uh, I'm just going to give you a very quick rundown of the things that we're looking to discuss this evening. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about the Avalanche situation and how, how at the moment it's, um, it's, it's been a, a crazy season for lots of reasons. And, and John Fulton is going to give us a heads up on all that kind of um, information and try and help us understand the situation in more detail. And then we've got um, Sasha that's going to talk about the avalanche danger scale. Um, Xavier, um, hopefully, is going to tell us a little about his, a bit about his experience so far um, this winter up on the mountains. Um, then David's going to introduce um, the confidence, confidence versus experience um, session. And then we're going to talk to people, like talk to the pros, I think, to Xavier and to Andre about some of their experiences and how that has kind of influenced the decisions that they've made um, further along in their career. Um, and then we're also gonna, we're gonna touch on, um, or we're gonna talk about the decisions and what these guys, all these pros do to stay safe on a powder day. And uh, the idea is not to try and um, to lecture or educate too much this evening. It's more about just a discussion between some professionals um, and to hopefully build awareness um, for all of us when we ski off piece. I mean, we're all constantly learning. Um, and I think this is a good opportunity to learn some things from some, from some guys that are very experienced. Um, John, would you like to, um, to start, mate, and maybe talk about the, um, the situation, really, how it is, explain things, um, how, it's a, how it's turned to be, how it is this season so far? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, good evening, everybody. I can't see you, but hopefully you can see me and the other... Uh, fine looking young gentleman on the panel. Um, first, just uh, I've been, I came to Verbier when I was 18 years old in, in 1973. So uh, quite a few years ago, I've watched the evolution of Verbier and uh, observed every season uh, since 1973. And uh, some of the people ask me, we'll go, well, is this season? actually different um, and my answer to that is yes uh, there's been other seasons where 
<clears throat> it, 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 we've had similar starts where we've had um, little snow at the beginning, but this season has been particularly, particularly severe in that sense. Um, so I'll, I'll, I want to try and keep it brief so that we can move along. But um, uh, what happens, I've got a couple of little notes here that I've reminded because at my age, you need to remind yourself what you're doing. Um, so there's, uh, this year we've got very little snow and it's uh, different to a year with a lot of snow. When you get a lot of snow coming in and regular snowfalls uh, each week, hopefully in a good, in an ideal world in Japan, it's five days a week, but here, we, we live in the, in the central Europe and we're in a continental climate. So we're far away from the sea. So our storms in a good year might come in once a week or once every 10 days or so. These accumulated snowfalls actually bond together quite well. And often what you're doing is you're only dealing with the most recent snowfall. Now, this year is not about a season with a lot of snow as most of you probably have realized, you've maybe had to repair your skis and boards quite a lot um, just due to the rocks and stuff. So when there's a, a year with little snowfall, <clears throat> and we had our first, uh, we had our, our first snowfall, I think it was back in, uh, in September, it was the very first snowfall this year. Uh, and that put a layer of snow on the ground uh, in the north sides, especially that stayed in there. And then nothing happened for over a month, almost two months, nothing happened, but the snow that was on the ground was sitting there. And it doesn't just sit there as fine powder. What it does is it, it actually, they usually forms a little crust on the surface, but underneath that, between the ground and the surface of your, your, your snow, you, the snow is going through a transformation and that snow actually uh, degrades. It goes through a destructive cycle. And so you get all this stuff and if you dug your hand into it, it feels like sugar, okay? And you can just pour it through your hands and then you get a little crust. Then you get a new layer of snow coming in on top of that. And this year, no snowfall happened immediately after, after another one. There was always a pause of, two, three weeks between each snowfall. So that new layer came in as a, as, a, as a new crust. And maybe John, you could put up that picture that I wanted to show you of the, of the snow layer. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've, I've took a picture. Um, so what happens is you're getting like a, 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 a milfoy, you know, those one of those uh, puff pastries with lots of air in between it, little thin crusts. Um, are you able to put that slide up, John? I'm going to try. Okay. <laughs> um, so it, it essentially what happens is you get a whole lot of layers of snow, these little thin crusts, and in between each layer, you've got an unconsolidated uh, lot of, of crystals that have all transformed into, into essentially um, uh, un- uh, let me find the words. It, it, well, it's not consolidated so that, well, there, there we go. If you look, um, at Christmas, I went away because the snow wasn't great here. And I went away to Samaritz for three weeks uh, where that first picture was taken with the avalanche and the skiers tracks. And I came back to Verbier and I was a bit disturbed by the snow that I found when I came back because I'd be walking along and suddenly I'd feel the snow collapse. There'd be kind of a whooping sound and so I decided to dig a pit. And if you look at this, this is a very rough, uh, a rough pit. I just dug a hole. And if you, uh, the, the ground is just below that bottom, the bottom layer there under the shovel. And you can see that the snow has just fallen out. And then you've got about a two to three centimeter layer of, of crust with another layer that's just fallen out. I didn't dig that out. It just fell out. Then you can see there's another two layers with little thin, uh, thin loose bits in between. And then on the very surface, there's about you know, 15, 15 centimeters of, of uh, fairly solid snow. Now, this year in Verbier, and one reason, if you look around Verbier, you may have seen 
a lot of avalanches just pulling out by themselves, not even with skiers in there. And when the patrollers have been patrolling, you've seen maximum avalanches coming out. It's because the delicate layers on the bottom are pulling out and coming all the way from the surface. It's not just the surface snow we're dealing with, we're going right to the ground. And that's essentially what I see in Verbia at the moment. Uh, and it's still there. Some of it's come out, but there's still a lot of pockets with this unstable layer in it. Um, so that's uh, essentially what we're looking at this winter in Verbia. And if anybody else would like to, any of the panel would like to sort of add on to that, uh, I'd be grateful. Thanks, John. That was a great, great little explanation. Um, are you thinking those those um, pockets are going to be around for a while? Uh, I'd say that they're they're in the they're in the snowpack uh, for the season. Uh, there may be a period of time uh, if we get some greater snowfalls where um, things might stabilize. We need to have some temperature changes that are going to lock things up, yep. but. At, at present, I'd say they're with us. And I think that this uh, spring, you're going to notice everything is going to start pulling out all the way to the ground uh, once things start to warm out because the, the surface layer of snow is going to become so fragile. And then you're going to get, it, it's not just the, the surface last snowfall. It might be two, two snowfalls ago or three snowfalls ago where things are going to start to pull out. Okay. So uh, I, I be aware that it's not over yet. And uh, in, my, in, in my job as a guide, which is hopefully to try and keep people safe, uh, I'm going to be approaching this winter with quite a lot of uh, respect and caution. Thank you. Sasha, yeah. um, do you, have you got anything to add to that from your, your sort of experiences? Um, well, I, th I think it changed the last week because of the, of the rain. It rained until 2006, and I think below that, when it, it got colder, it, now it's way more stable. And um, when it really low, below 2000, I think the, the moisture went almost to the ground. So in some place, I think it kind of destroyed that really weak base layer. But the problem we had now is the, the, the sandstorm we had, and now it's gonna have another big problem for the rest of the winter because that layer of sand um, also is gonna be with us until the end and that's gonna be another really really big problem I think mm -hmm. that's gonna stay for the rest of the winter but also as I see for the last year the, the it's very different now if you ski on the glacier or if you ski like Kreble on rocky part because I think on the glacier, that transformation of weak layer of snow is not the same. It's, it's, that appears more into moraines or rocks or grass than actually it appears on, on glaciers. So sometimes we, you don't really see that when you ski on a glacier. You see that more when you ski like Kreble, when you have grass, rocks, and stuff like that. And I think um, that's also something that it's, it's changing all the time, but I think this season is going to be a particular, you know, a strange season for sure. Yeah. And regarding the um, avalanche danger scale, because that was something that you were going to chat about, Sasha, do you imagine, or can you, can you maybe explain a little bit about why that's, why that's important, why that's a useful tool for people when they're kind of um, heading out onto the slope, onto the off piece. But um, also, can you, do you, th do you think it's going to stay like uh, a level three for the season? Like, do we, do you imagine it going? Oh, no, we're on already on level two or today on the, uh on the right uh, side of the valley. It went mm -hmm. down to level two today. Okay. All the Diableret region is on two. We're on three on, uh, on here. Um, I just think the, the problem for me uh, with, with that, um, it's not very relevant because when all these accidents happened last week, uh, it was three, but it was a three plus plus, you know, I, I would always say if it was on 10, it would be seven. You know, it's just below four. And three is, is as a big range, I think. It can be three minus or three plus. And that yeah. makes a huge difference, I think. Yeah. And, and 
also people they lost the respect of of number three danger they they take it as something kind of of low and i think it's still a really big risk yeah and two years ago we had those people skiing uh the petit rogneau in creble if, i don't know if people know uh, where what i'm talking about but it's uh it's near cold i mean it's steep and they skied that place on a high avalanche danger and it was local people friends of mine basically people that i know and that's something we, we rarely seen before like people skiing very quickly on high avalanche danger they go on 40 45 degree slopes people skiing below and i think the whole attitude is in verbier is a bit strange for that i think not degree three is is not very people don't take it for something very serious yeah yeah it, the word the number three um perhaps it's more important to look at the words and what the description of what it actually is because yeah the number three is um it's kind of in the middle isn't it it's in the middle. Also, they say when 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 the slope is is tracked, after each snowfall, you can almost go down a degree. So people now they start to understand that a bit in verbiage. So they say, okay, it's three, but it's two because Kobe been skied after the last snowfall, so it's probably two. This year, everyone has been a bit tricked because the lower base is very fragile, and so even if you ski on top of it, uh, the the lower base is still. Um, not very consistent and, yeah. and so that's why people are, are making mistakes this season I think. Okay thanks Sasha. Um, Xavier, um, would, can you, you've been up the mountain quite a lot this winter I guess, so can you give us a bit of an insight into what, what you've seen and how, you, how you've seen kind of the conditions from a rider's perspective? Well, for me, what I've seen, well, I haven't been that much because I've had a bit of a painful knee, but I've been up regularly yeah. and I'm um, following what happens all the time. And what I saw is not, maybe not more avalanches than normal, but like uh, really what strikes me is the way they propagate uh, every time and the way they go in places where normally they wouldn't go. Like it has slid, uh, like sometimes in places uh, yeah, as Sasha said, they were like fully skid uh, mm -hmm. that had been like taking quite a lot of sun and stuff, and and that would be normally considered as a as as safe. And there's been so many surprises that it it kind of uh, shakes a bit. Like you know, we all build up this kind of uh, kind of not routine, but like we get used to certain conditions, and especially in around Atlas, around Kreble, around these areas that there are. Yeah really easy to access after snowfall that are uh, ridden a lot. Uh, and now this year, like you have to put all of that kind of mindset into the garbage because everything is kind of new. And that's something that's really, really difficult when you know an area well to mm -hmm. try to reset your, your way of action. Yeah. It's, been, um, yeah, it's been tough, yeah. No, and uh, yeah, like we've seen uh, the, like what has happened a bit in Verbier and I've been witnessing uh, one of the accidents. Yeah. Uh, so it's been really terrible. I never had to face that in my life before. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's been like really hard to digest. Yeah. And um, yeah, someone I knew and it happened really quickly and the run he went in like in the Atlas Gruar, I was also going to go down there. And like we talked about avalanche, um, you know, degrees a bit before, you know, how, yeah, it's been like three on, on some of the most lethal days. And on that day, it went from four to three. It was tracked like in like most of the places. And I remember telling myself that I would go into that place, which went and uh, which cost the life um, to Jamie because, but I was with uh, another group I'm with a group of guys, which I didn't know too much the level, so I took it easy. Yep. Uh, yeah, the way he's been tricked is that, like, normally the slab that would normally go on a normal season, I would think, like, which is kind of at the bottom of the couloir there, it went, like, all the way up the couloir, it went all the way on the side, so leaving absolutely no space to escape. And, um, and it's been kind of really um, shocking to see that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you, man. Um, David, John, how are you? I'm great, great. Um, listening to all our stories, uh, <laughs> tell me. Um, I'm going to pass over to David now. He's um, 
an experienced base jumper. I don't know, if some of you may know him, some of you may not, but he's a very experienced base jumper. He's, he's passionate about snowboarding as well, but um, he actually trains people to, um, to base jump or learn to base jump. Um, and he's going to tell us a little bit about his, um, his kind of perspectives on, on risk and, and his understanding of how we all kind of go through a cycle. Um, and I think all the, the people here and everyone's very experienced has all, all had certain experiences, probably um, made a big change to the, the way they do things in their own riding. Um, but yeah, David, do you want to tell us a little bit about your, uh, your idea? Yeah, so um, first of all, I'm not an avalanche expert, so I won't talk about the technical aspect of it. Um, there are way more qualified people tonight to talk about it. Um, and yeah, I'm just an average snowboarder and I'm as excited as everyone to learn from them tonight. Um, as John said, I do have experience in world sports. I'm full-time base jumper since nine years and I teach base jumping in the summer. I spend most of my time doing um, risk evaluation, decision making, and trying to stop my students from doing something stupid. Um, so tonight I would like to share my experience about uh, the risk of overconfidence and the, psychologi the psychological traps people fall into. The first thing I would like to talk about is um, the risk versus fun balance. First of all, risk zero doesn't exist. Any outdoor activity comes with a certain level of risk. With no risk, you stay on your sofa. With too much risk, you can end up at the hospital or in a coffin. We don't want any of that. Uh, obviously, we don't want to die, but we also want to live. We are trying here to find the right balance between risk and fun. What is worth it or not? Whether I jump or ride, my goal is to maximize the, sorry, my goal is to maximize the fun while keeping the amount of risk at a manageable level. Sometimes you can have more fun doing a certain line or a certain jump, but that extra fun comes with extra risk and it's not worth it. Your, your ability to assess whether it's worth taking the risk or not um, is the difference between being in control or just getting away with stuff. And we all get away with stupid stuff once in a while. Um, we go a bit over the limit, but if you keep getting away with stuff over and over, at some point, it's gonna bite you in the ass. Um, in base jumping, we often say that we start the sport with two jars. You have one jar of luck and you have one jar of experience. Your jar of experience is empty at the beginning and your jar of luck is full. And every time you do something a little bit sketchy, or make a mistake, you take out of your jar of luck and you put in the jar of experience. At some point, you're gonna need to use that jar of experience because you're gonna run out of luck. Maybe what I'm saying right now seems obvious uh, because ideally in the world of unicorns and rainbows, everyone should learn a lesson from their bad experiences and move on. But I see something different happening. Um, what happens instead is that people see their luck as the new standard. Oh, I've skied with avalanche risk four, nothing happened, so it's not as bad as they say. I can keep doing it. And I see, I see a lot um, this attitude. So if there is one lesson or something that I would like um, people maybe to remember tonight is to be really careful with good experiences but become the wrong feedback. How do you keep risk at a low level? I personally see three things. Knowledge of your environment, skills, self-awareness. The knowledge of your environment is all the theory. It's what you learn with books or with experienced people, with a guide. Um, this is what we're doing tonight. And I'm happy to see that more than 200 people joined because it's a first step in the good direction. The skills is what you train by being on the mountain and practicing. It's a really natural process and it's fun. So everyone is doing it. Self-awareness, 
I think it's the most important and yet uh, the most neglected. Self-awareness is for me more important than skills because an incompetent rider that is aware of his incompetence will be way safer than someone competent that doesn't know his limits. And I would like to, to, to talk about the dangers of self-evaluation and overconfidence. Assessing your own level is really important, but it's extremely hard um, for two reasons. First, because you are biased by your ego. Your ego gets in the way. And also because you don't know what you don't know. And we are all likely to be victim from what we call the Dunning-Kruger effect. I don't know if any of you guys heard of it? Wait, no? Okay, <laughs> we'll go for it. Um, I printed that paper earlier that shows a um, curve. On your horizontal axis, you have your level of competence. And on the vertical, you have your level of confidence. At the really beginning of any activity, you know nothing. So you don't have, you don't have competence, you don't have confidence, you're at zero. When you start learning, you build up a lot of confidence because you start knowing about your environment, but your level of competence is really minimal still. <laughs> it's a very, very dangerous stage to be in right here because you have enough experience to get confident, but you don't grasp the complexity of the environment you evolve in, and you come with simplistic conclusion that pushes you to do the wrong choices. Um, you're in the danger zone, you're not only confident, you're complacent. Eventually, you will realize with experience that you're not as good as you think you are and you fall down uh, to a really low level of uh, self-confidence, which is actually funny because you're still more competent than you were before, but you lost confidence. And eventually, like this pushes you to learn, know a bit more, gain some experience, and eventually you will get to a place where you gain some experience and you gain again in confidence and your self-assessment is correct. Um, if, you, if you look at this graph, actually it looks like a mountain. You know, you're climbing up uh, the mountain of overconfidence fueled by your ego. Um, then you tumble down to the valley of humility or you literally tumble down uh, <laughs> from Bec de Rose, which can be painful. You stay a while at the bottom thinking, ah, shit, I shouldn't have done it. And eventually you will hike back to a better place. The goal and what I try to explain to my students is that you, you need to try to practice to get to that level of humility spontaneously before a painful event forces you to do it you will get uh, to that level eventually, but there are two ways to get there. You can either learn from others, this is the nice way, or you can learn by doing your own mistakes. This is the hard way. Um, mistakes are painful and, uh, and sometimes deadly, so I recommend to everyone um, to learn from others instead. If you feel like you know enough if you have never been through a period of doubt over your skills, there is a high chance that you are still in the danger zone of overconfidence. Question yourself, talk to experienced people, share knowledge, try to know where you're at. And if you think you are in that danger zone, take a step back, do less than what you think you're capable of and work on acquiring knowledge. Knowledge is safety. Safety will allow you to scale longer. The psychological trap I just described can happen to absolutely anyone, no matter how smart you are. It's nothing to do with intelligence. You have really intelligent people that fall into this trap. When an accident happens, people naturally like to think that the victims were stupid. It's a defense mechanism that allows them to detach themselves from the accidents. And it also allows them to not question their own practice and carry on doing their thing. When you learn from other people's mistakes, the goal is to acquire knowledge. Don't just use it as a way to comfort, to comfort yourself in your own practice. 
Again, it's important to understand that mistakes can, appear, can happen to everyone. Everyone can be too confident. So it's good to be aware of, uh, aware of your own weaknesses. I have myself um, experienced or done a really stupid decision last year, um, which I'm not really proud of, but I'm still going to share it. Um, I was on my way to Stairways that was uh, still fresh and untouched. Um, I met actually Xavier in the cable car that told us that he was not going there because it was way too risky at the moment. <clears throat> when we arrived there with my friends, uh, we saw it completely untouched, beautiful, so tempting that we decided to go. <laughs> we went anyway. Um, the danger was accessing to stairway. We were making the track and the layer was quite weak. And as we were walking on the way up, it all cracked. It didn't fall, but it cracked, making us all stop. The guy in front of us freaked out and skied off. So he cut um, the mountain on top of us, which was uh, making it even more dangerous. And we were in a position, we were halfway, so it was as dangerous to go back than going up. So we took the decision to continue going up and eventually we got lucky. We arrived to the top, we skied, we had a nice line, face shots, happy smiles and a beer afterwards. Um, I came back to John later at the office and told, uh, told him about the amazing time I just had. And after I told him my story, he just looked at me and say, so, it's too dangerous for Xavier Delorue, but it's good enough for you. You're that good. <laughs> Translation, David, you're a complete idiot. And he was right. <laughs> and I got defensive when he showed me my mistake. But eventually, when I got back home, um, I looked at myself in the mirror and realized that he was right and I was an idiot. I got lucky that day. And I'm going to take from my jar of luck and put in the jar of experience. And I've learned three things. First one is that I can get carried away as much as anyone else. So I need to keep checking on myself to stay in control. Second thing I learned is that no matter how de defensive someone gets, um, they can realize that they did a mistake and process the information later. So if you see something wrong, speak up, you might save a friend. You might get angry on the moment, but later the information will sink in and you might save him. The first thing I've learned is that the performance of a pro athlete is only the tip of the iceberg. Behind the sick lines we watch on YouTube, there are many lines they refuse to do, even the simplest. So maybe we promote and admire too much and show too much on the video, the performance and not enough of the safety. Uh, and it's, um, it's confusing the people that don't really know the reality of the terrain. Um, I'm pretty much done here. If Xavier wants to continue on that and talk about his, uh, okay. his evaluation as a, as a pro. Well, no, but I think you probably have this image of me that I'm going to go and do the first track all the time. But um, I think, you know, you showed that curve of overconfidence going back to down to humility and then going back up. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I really find that it doesn't go back up with snow because snow is such a tricky element that, uh, yeah, like Sasha said before, the more you know, the more you realize that uh, uh, it tricks you all the time and, and that you don't know anything. And for me, it is like, I find it really, really, really painful because, um, yeah, I don't know, like every, every so often you've got this nice period where you gain confidence, you have a lot of fun, you feel that you're in control and everything, and then boom, something happens. And this year it's even like way worse than normal because it can kind of completely different, like completely uh, destroys that, that feeling of uh, like knowledge that, that you can have. And uh, for me, like from the beginning, I've always felt that it was important to, to know you know, to uh, like to understand the snow and everything. But uh, I always felt that there was really limits to that. And, um, and, and therefore, you know, with the experience, like, yeah. So, uh, you know, yeah, I, fi I find that, you know, a knowledge is good because it helps you to take the first step of the decision. But then after a while, you will never be able to take the full right uh, decision in a conscious way. And, and in a way, I kind of, 
take uh, all my decision making in crisis management like that's kind of my personal way uh, that i found to deal with it where i kind of no more or less okay this is a sensible choice i take always a lot of margin and the more the years go by and the more margin i go so the less i'm going to go and climb that the that, that thing uh, that you've been climbing and then uh, i write it I, I try to force myself to imagine always the worst like so i'm, I'm always like okay the worst 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 okay if the worst happens am i like what's going to happen am i able to play with it am i able to kind of escape from it am i able to prevent it and, uh, and if it doesn't work, then I don't go. And then if, if there is a solution, then I, I, I go away with it. But yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, I, I'm in a weird place right now, actually, to be honest, like, because, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, because of the season and also because of, yeah, so many years of having weird surprises. Throughout the years, there's been so many times where things were so clear that they were not gonna go and then something so unexpected happened. And then after a while, it makes you think uh, like that this sport is like no other sport at all. Like even base jumping being considered as the, the craziest sport, I think, you know, like more and more, I find free riding more tricky than base jumping in a way, because the snow is such a uh, like, yeah, uber tricky element. Is that, Xavier, is that this season or is it been building up for a while? Well, it's worse this season because of what happens and also because I have been spending less time on snow as well because of my knee. I think when, when you're on snow, you, you, you start to bond a bit with what's happening. You're on the moment and uh, you don't let your brain kind of um, uh, like speculate too much. And, and like you, so in a way, like, yeah, uh, usually when, when I'm up a lot, I, I start to feel better. But I don't know. Right now it's... Uh, it's a, it's a bit tough yeah i find uh, also myself i agree with you uh doing actually the both activities um free riding more scary than base jumping because you have more uncontrolled parameter um in on the snow and you can try to plan everything but you're still taking a chance um what's important for me is to for people to understand what kind of chance they're taking i have no problem uh, with people taking of risk and committing to something as long as they're fully aware of uh, the consequences uh, that can happen and they take uh, the full responsibility for it. I have a lot of pain getting people motivated and going for something that uh, they think they can get away with, but they don't realize the consequences. I think this is what makes me uh, the most sad in both activities. Thanks, man. Um, Andre, do you have you felt the same as you're like? Has your confidence was it a lot higher at the start of your kind of uh, competing and is it changed a bit these days or are you, you need to unmute yourself yes definitely um i feel really much like like xavier i would say in, in that way like you know as more as more you learn like you just start to know that you don't know much <laughs> and this is like it's in some way um um well it's in some way scary and like if you if you like write something like you like write it so many times the same way and then like you write it a little bit more to the left and and it's just all goes it feels like whoa you know like i thought like it was good um so if i could give any advice like if people would like to go anyway whatever just because they overconfidence or they want to do it mm -hmm. is what xavier said before like that to know where you at when when you write to like you know already the goal or you know like the face you write to to get in that way like at, at an advantage when it's happened and thinking yourself always like okay i'm up here now like i know what i'm gonna write but so let's say like it will happen. So before every run you do, you, you tell yourself like it's, it's probably gonna happen. Then you, you have an advantage in that way of like, okay, then what, what, where will the avalanche go? What prob possibly goes and stuff like that. This mm -hmm. year, it's much, much harder to do that. And like, I'm, <clears throat> I didn't do much this year. I was staying like just like where the good snow was in the trees and stuff like that. 
Um, if I could, one more advice is the stomach feel, uh, the stomach feeling. This is like probably one of the hardest thing to 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 learn and listen to yourself, but like to to be maybe you know maybe you hike up for one hour to to something you want to write, and up there you feel like ah, it's it's not quite right, and there to say like look I'm not gonna do it. This is super hard, and to to learn that to that's that's the experience, and I think this yeah like um, David said before. It's uh, it's it's really hard to to learn that. But you, you got you got to yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. If I can just say um, yeah. on what uh, Andre just said, I think giving your yourself permission to say I don't have to do this is one of the biggest gifts you can do to yourself and your friends. Um, I've been at the top of the Petit Combat after landing in a helicopter. Uh, skiing with a colleague of mine who is a, another guide. We, we went down the, the ridge uh, for about 20 meters. And then he radiated up to me and he said, listen, I don't like this. I don't feel good about it. We're going to go back the mellow way. And I think that to give yourself permission to say no, even on runs that you've done before a hundred times is possibly one of the biggest gifts you can give to yourself and the people who care for you. Um, and you you can go back again in a week or next year because the mountain will still be there and maybe the conditions might be better. And there's a different feeling when the conditions are right than when they're sketchy. It's interesting hearing you guys saying, like Andre saying that he's not he's not been up this much. Xavier um, hasn't been up loads. It's it is a obviously it's a very um, hard season to predict anything um, but what I've seen I've been up quite a lot just more teaching this season but um, I've seen people like skiing everything all the time and it's still you know there's been so many you know you, it snows and the next few hours later everything's been skied um, and do you think there is like Verbier seems unique compared to other places and this is kind of, I'm putting this to the whole panel really. Does, has anyone got any ideas? Like, it seems that Verbier like normalizes free riding almost. It, like it, some of the things that you guys are talking about, it's not like the risks have been normalized because there's so many people doing it. Um, what do you think? Sasha. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, but I think that's what we promote in Verbier, I think, in a way. I mean, Verbier is a, it's, we're marketing on the free ride. We're marketing on the, on the amazing of peace. That's, that's what we promote. Uh, what, what do you expect? That's always my, my point. What, what do we expect at the end of the day? People are going up on the powder day on top of, of, finish space and, and ski down back to Rina from, I mean, come on guys, like that's not gonna happen. That will never happen. Yeah. So um, I, I think, and I've done exactly the same as, as Xavier said before, I mean, he's totally right. Also with age, you see different things. I mean, if you're 18 and you, and you buy a motorbike, you're not gonna ride it the same way at 20, then you're gonna ride it at 50. Maybe at 50, you're gonna be on a Harley Davidson great but i mean <laughs> when you're 20 you want to go for it and and i think it's it's we we can't talk like uh old past and you know like like now we know and we are more careful i mean young people won't still have the kick they want to they won't have their sensation they want to they want what they do what they see in the movies and they want to do what what other, what they swirly around on, on TV and stuff like that. What do you expect on, on a good day, on a Sunday after spending five days in the <laughs> office? What do, you, what do you think they're gonna, mm -hmm. they're gonna stay I down in Verbia? I, I don't think that will ever happen. Yeah. And I think Verbia is, is it, but it's, it's now it's a lot, in a lot of places it's the same. Gressonne is the same, Chamonix is the same. Uh, I had a good chat with Xavier's brother one day in Chamonix saying to Victor, like, we had a chat because he, he was taking off. And I said to him, ah, it's, how is it in Chamonix now to ride? And he said, the problem when you want to be the first on the ride, it's always one day too early. 
That's what he told me. And I say, yeah, I can totally understand. You would like to wait another day, but you feel the pressure because another one's going to do it. So you're going to do it, but maybe it's going to be one day too early. But you mm -hmm. know it's one day too early, but you're still going to do it, right? And, and even people in Verbia, they don't even have that choice. There's, it's, there's too much pressure of the crowd. You, you, you have to be fast. You don't have to, to feel what's inside you or, or, or listen to your feelings because you jump out the funny, funny space with, with 40 other guys going to do the same run, basically. So you want to be the first. You have to be fast. You don't have to think. You go for it. And that's it. I don't, I don't think there's any thinking behind all these things, you know? Yeah. That's, I think, the main problem. You don't have time to think. If have you, you seen it change since when you first started riding here? Well, but when I, 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 we started really riding a lot when I was like 12, 13, we, we had the first snowboard. And at the time, people with, with straight skis of 210 were not going so much off piece. So, so with snowboard, we had that access to, to all these cool R. And the, the only difference, we didn't have the pressure of the crowd again. We had time to think and sometimes turn back. We, we, we were not in that kind of a rush to be the first. And that's, for me, what changed in the most in Verbia. It's that energy on the weekend, or even not even the weekend anymore. Any day of the week, a powder day is a stressful day in Verbia. So that's why, for me, or probably John said the same before, we don't really want to go there to guide um, clients who basically hire you for safety. And... Last week, I lost a good friend in an avalanche, a mountain guide. He's 56. He's been guiding for 30 years. A, a guy who was really careful, like seriously, like always careful. He was in um, a rock garden. Nine people went before him, uh, tracking the slope. He went down. Nothing happened. His client went down. Everything came down, and, uh, and he died. And... <sighs> Yeah, it's, it's very hard, I think, to make theory about avalanches for that because it's, it's crazy. You never know what's going to happen, I think, in a way. And with age, you, you, as Xavier said, your level of confidence stays low, by the way. Just like it, it doesn't go back up because the more you go out there, you're like, fuck, I would never think it will happen like this, you know? And, and that's the point. So, I, But my worry is like, what, what, what can you do? You, yeah. I'm still going to go skiing. I'm still going to mm. hopefully, as you said, ReZero doesn't exist, you know, and yeah. you have to, I think, in a way, accept it, but try to, to really put everything on your side. And that's my point, I think. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, yeah, I, yeah, Sash, I think that you're, you're correct. I think that there comes a certain time in your life where you, you need to take responsibility for what you're doing, for your attitude. Um, I worked as a stunt man for a number of years, and I had a bottom line when I was asked to do thing. I gave myself the right to say no. I, it didn't make me less <clears throat> less of a skier or less badass as that's last century. I like to reiterate, but <clears throat> you know, I, I still jumped out of the helicopter. But there was times when the conditions weren't right uh, that I actually learned to say no. And uh, I think that all of us have to learn to have that self-discipline to know that perhaps it's not right to get caught up in the race. <clears throat> now, as a guide, I often let people go. And then sometimes you get to ski a better line because everybody's so racing to get something that they, they don't see. Where, where something could be really good and rewarding. Uh, you know, I, I, more and more, I'm just trying not to get caught up in the race, if possible. Yeah, good advice. Yeah, um, I, I agree with, uh, with John with that when Sasha was talking before. Um, it is, you know, for sure, like it, it's a race if you want to be at a race and maybe like being the first one down is it's probably like a pleasure, but like it is as pleasant like being the tense like you just go a bit more left a bit more right you see maybe like a takeoff of something which i'd like you, you always still have a choice you stay on top of the atlas gold bars you look down and like yeah i want to do it i don't want to do it it's like you have that choice so it's it, 
I think you should just give yourself that time to to make that question to yourself. Do I want to do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, when it's a uh, like sunny day, powder, and then I plan to go and ride in Verbier, I forbid myself to go at nine o'clock on the first lift. I always go around 10 and usually I will stay at the bottom and I wait until 11, 12 maybe and to really see what's happening. And, and then maybe I'll start to go and play around. But yeah, I'll like I'll never go and open runs really. Like unless I've been riding in, the, in like in like unless the snowpack has been there for a few days and I've built confidence in it, then I'm going to go and open uh, runs and, and it's going to feel great. But yeah. Uh, yeah, like for me, it's uh, it's becoming more and more no go. Really, this is a this is a experience. Uh, you first send hundreds of crash test dummies, and you ski <laughs> level, <laughs> and then you live longer. Good one. Uh, I <clears throat> I saw something. Somebody posted, "Why doesn't Televerbier um, control all the Atlas Coolwas and stuff like that?" I'm not sure if people are aware. And Sash, you could probably. Correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I understand, Televerbia is not allowed to bomb on the on the uh, Kulwa side of Atlas because if an avalanche goes down and goes all the way across the flats into Verbier and hits a chalet, which could potentially happen and in days gone by with big snowpack, they actually are not allowed to due to responsibility to actually bomb the actual Kulwa side of uh, of uh of atlas is am i correct in that sash well they, they they bomb it sometimes i think they know when they can and they can't but they, the petit Ronio sometimes they, they put a bomb when they can go with the chopper in the morning yeah it also depends on the weather but uh, also uh, you can't really bomb the off piste right it's no where, where where you where you start when you stop like <laughs> where, where where if i don't know and also, uh, I think that's what's interesting. Also, it, it's um, we go there to feel free and to to experience uh, nature, uh, and and that's the game I really like to play to try to understand it. Sometimes, even uh, if you get your ass kicked, but I mean, it's it's very interesting to be. Uh, I think we have to stay humble, and I think what a lot of people forget is to stay humble. You know, whatever you do, just just take time to think before you 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 take you do an action, and and that's I think the main point in Verbi. People don't take time; they don't have time, or maybe they stress during the week, and they they bring up the same stress over the weekend when they come skiing. They they need that that to to evacuate the stress of the week or whatever, but they still find themselves in the same kind of stress that they probably live over the week in the city because running out the finish space to to go skiing i mean come on like that doesn't make me dream anymore i think i'm i'm, I'm too old for that shit <laughs> been there and done that <laughs> yeah i've been there but not even i think not very often it's a bit too easy for us to say that because we live yeah. here so we have the luxury of taking the time exactly but for someone yeah. that has a his one week holiday or his few weekends I've always been dreaming of powder all the time, watching pro riders like uh, showing the, uh, like the only the the gold side of, uh, gold side of the coin, and dreaming about it. Yeah, it's just so hard to to resist. Like, yeah, it's all right. You're so right. It's yeah, right. and and for me, like you know, the reason I was explaining why I don't go uh, like in the first morning, it's not because I don't want to be caught in the stress and everything. It's just that when you're up there, in a way, it's just so nice. Uh, like like the the dream of riding uh, like a first track into a line is like is so tempting and even with all the bad experiences even uh, with everything that I lived through I know that I'm not going to be like not necessarily strong enough to resist and to say no like uh, and like for someone that has never had uh, like the slap in the face or a bad experience or, or, or something like this like how can they turn back because yeah. for sure it's their weekend so for sure they're gonna go first lift because uh they want to make most of it and when mm -hmm. they're gonna go and be up there and see everyone dropping everywhere how yeah. can they turn back like and, it, and it's good to be hard. the first i think it's 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 a real for me i mean i don't agree something i i, I quite <laughs> like to be the first it's good 
when you have a virgin powder in front of you, it's, it's so nice to be the first to write it. I think it's, it's so cool. No, I, it is, but uh, like when I say it, it's like on the first good weather day of powder day and you go into the resort, you know, when, like, when you fall into that powder fever yeah. trap, like that's when it's not good anymore. And that's when it's good to just step back. Yeah. But then the is wait a little bit, like maybe a day or two, you're going to be able to go and find those runs where you're going to be on your own and you're going to have your first track and that's magical, but you do it. Like, I think that's a bit more of a sensible way to do it, but yeah. John, and yeah. also, also I, I had something, I, I thought about something uh, before I said, always you, you maybe we should take, um, when we go riding something, well, what would you do without an airbag and without a beeper? How far would you go? Would you, would you ski that? You remove your backpack, you remove your beeper. Would you go down? If you if if the answer is yes, you probably you probably pretty safe, I reckon. Yeah. yeah. John, if John, if John, you like, no, I don't know. John, did, did you did you start skiing with uh, with beepers? No. No. When when I first arrived here, uh, they didn't. The transceivers hadn't been uh, invented at that point in time. It was about. Uh, I arrived in seventy three. The. Um, the transceivers, I think, came out at 75 or 76 was the first one. I'd been already caught in one big avalanche then, and I was first in line to get them when they came out. <laughs> yeah, I'd taken a, a ride for about 300 metres over cliffs and stuff like that. I was extremely lucky. Um, and when, they, when, when I began to understand, I did it because I had no understanding and I got slapped, but luckily, you know, I, I was able to move forward, but it was a big learning lesson and it made me want to learn more about it. Yeah. Um, just listening to everyone and talking about the, um, the temptation of the powder and what Xavier is saying there with, um, you know, people, if they're coming for a week, it's very hard to, uh, to resist that temptation. What, what do you do, John, on a, on a powder day to prepare yourself? What kind of things? Um, important to do as a, as a professional guide first thing i get up and i have a cup of coffee stretch out <laughs> no that's my you know you've got a li your little morning routines and stuff but uh, as we now have internet and everything like that um part of our responsibility is actually to check what the avalanche forecast is for the day uh so i check the weather and i i get i look at uh this uh, website called white risk um which gives me a lot of information about the current avalanche situation uh, yesterday, today, and, and projecting towards tomorrow. So you actually have a, a backlog of information that you can, you can look up. And if you start to read it regularly, you can begin to understand it a little bit. It's all, you know, they use certain terms, but it's in English, it's in French, it's in German, Italian. Um, so you can choose your language. So there's no excuse not to understand it. So that is, that is part of my, uh, um, my morning process when I know that I'm, I'm going out. Um, I also make sure that I've got all the right gear. So transceiver, uh, shovel probe, airbag, if you use an airbag, um, you make sure that's all ready. You make sure the batteries in your transceiver are good at home, not when you're at the top of the mountain, you know. Uh, when I get to the, the lift, you know, also I choose the number of people I'm skiing with. Uh, when I get to the meet the guys I'm skiing with, I do all the avalanche transceiver checks and stuff at the bottom of the mountain. So if somebody's a transceiver isn't working, I can either go on a higher one or I can go and buy batteries for it, you know, at the bottom, not when I get up to Atlas, you know. So I think that stuff like that is really important, simple things to do. As I'm riding up the lifts, I like to look around me. If I see the spontaneous avalanches, that's giving me a message that maybe things are a little bit delicate. If I see a lot of stuff moved with the explosions, uh, with the bombing, you know, that's also telling me that maybe things are, you know, a little bit delicate. If I see nothing's moved, that gives me another message. Um, uh, so there's, there's all of these different little things that, that I like to do in the morning when I, when I go, when I meet my friends. And, and it's not just about me and my clients. It's a, uh, uh, me and me and the friends I ski with, or if I go out alone, you know, I, I'm sure there's more things that you can add to that, but that's just off the top of my head. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want 
can I jump back on uh, what you were saying before about uh, you know, like the question of people uh, bombing, like well, like what why isn't Televerbi bombing uh, all the all the Atlas and everything, all the free art runs? And and I had actually the discussion the other day with uh, with PV, uh, like he's the the head of the ski patrols, and uh, he was saying that like so they've got two hundred points uh, like already in Verbier when they uh, like kind of do avalanche control. And basically, their mission is not to control uh, free ride runs. It's to control, uh, to make the, sa the safety for the pistes yeah. and for yeah. the itineraries. So yeah. like, like it's going to be, so they're going to be bombing for sure. If there is a slope underneath, if there is a traverse uh, on a free ride itinerary, and they're going to bomb that. But they're not going to bomb runs that people are going to ride. So that, this is something that's super important. Uh, to know and they're actually quite frustrated because uh, they can feel that like a lot of people don't like uh, don't know exactly what to expect and uh, like a lot of them probably expect that they will bomb all the free art runs because mm. uh, is a free art resort but that's not the way it is and um, yeah I think it's good to keep that in mind yeah definitely good to keep that in mind uh, John can I just say something people are uh, um are posting questions I said we mm. can't read the whole question you only get like yeah. the first quarter of the question so yeah, if David. we're not answering it perhaps they could ask it afterwards once we've finished yeah. David I think you're going to have a little look at the questions in a minute is that right have you are you able to see them yeah I'm actually looking at them right now okay Xavier we're just just following on from John was what John was talking about um, when you're up riding, um, is there any things that, you know, any tips or anything that you would give to people um, regarding safety, like things that you use when you're riding? Or... Uh, pop, pop, pop. It's hard to say. No, I, I, like personally, I like to keep it in a small group. And uh, yeah, I usually personally prefer uh, steeper runs uh, where I can feel uh like that i can control I, I feel that i control a little bit better uh like the the snow situation in those uh i am always like i'm super terrified of avalanches basically so anything that's gonna be wide open with potential like big accumulations i'm gonna be always quite nervous about it and that's not the kind of run that i'm gonna choose i will feel a lot more comfortable in something that's like more technical more exposed yeah. Uh, steeper but, but where i can go and find like a lot of safety places and basically in those kind of runs the way i like to run is to always um you know really like build a routine where you're always going to take the always going to go and stop to a safe spot so you're always going to go from one safe spot to the next one mm -hmm. with speed stop there wait for your friend to come uh, like and I like kind of build up this momentum and I don't like to write too much with new people even though you have a great time and things but I like to you know like stay with a like small team of people that, that I know they know exactly you know the, the thing that you have to do we've built up a routine and that kind of works well like this and I have more fun like that like as soon as uh, it's like three four people very often uh, you you can see that um a lot of mistakes start to be done there's uh, problems with communications like you lose a bit that routine and that focus that you can have so uh, yeah i don't know I, I kind of decided many years ago i think after my first avalanche to to be quite hardcore uh, in the way that i write to not just let uh, let too much the fun of the day kind mm -hmm. of uh, take away uh, the focus so so kind of i, I kind of forced myself to be a bit paranoid of uh, everything that could happen around. So I'm a bit of a party pooper uh, uh, sometimes, uh, especially for myself. But I think to me, it's been kind of the, pre the price to pay to keep on riding uh, yeah. like with, a, with a relative like uh, safety in a way. Yeah, with really a reasonable good. amount of risk, yeah. Thanks, man. Really good, really good tips there. Um, David, do you, I'm just, have you, have you looked at some questions there? Because I think we've... Yes, the, the question is a, a topic that is coming back um, is about like, uh, what can the pro do to change the, the, the general mindset? So we have Phil asking uh, how to change the thinking of the masses. We have Andrew that asks why, why wouldn't we do a system where the, 
the non-riders in Verbier could log onto the Televerbier website and um, and talk about the, the area they refused to ride uh, for the day. Um, they also ask why uh, Televerbier doesn't do a daily avalanche report. So basically, yeah, the questions are about um, what can Verbier and the riders do to show the example? I mean, Xavier, from from your experience, um, you 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 have a lot of followers on Instagram, etc. And I know that you you're very you know you, you do a lot of stuff about safety. But do you think that the ambassadors or the people that are promoting Verbier have some responsibility to also show this that all the safe things that these riders do to enable them to to, to have all these great shots and well, it's been uh, decades and decades that we just uh, make people um, like uh, salivate. Do you say that? Like, uh, like, <laughs> yeah, like a dog. Conditions and stuff. And, uh, and it's true that it hasn't been shown enough, like, uh, you know, like kind of the dark side of the coin. What, what can really happen? And I think that a lot of people don't realize. Uh, and last week I've had, um, like, you know, I've been confronted to that topic uh, in a more heavy way, like with, so, my daughter is 15. She's part of the free, uh, World Tour Club here, mm -hmm. um, and she starts to ride like really strong and stuff. It's been years that I ride with her, and I really built a lot of confidence. Uh, and like, I feel really good when I'm with her in the mountain because I know she reacts well, and she she usually does. She's usually quite trustable. And then last weekend, she went on on the day when it was avalanche sport uh, avalanche. Um, like uh, level number four, mm. we told her to not go. Her mom is a ski patrol and told her that it was like uh, crazy stuff was going down. And uh, she still let herself get sucked by her group. And she went into uh, Atlas Couloir just before it slid. Um, and that was kind of a, a big, big thing. And, and so we've had a massive discussions after that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, one of the things that came out of her is that no, but like, all the all the films uh, all the content that i see everything that i see people uh, they just get out of avalanches all the time they just write out of them it's just a, a normal thing in a way you know like she she kind of considers little slabs that you see in the movies as yeah. being avalanche and she has she doesn't realize what it is and so i've been trying to show her videos uh, like so for example from a rescue last year uh, when Emma Botkin so was under snow and like you mm -hmm. could see her digging uh, like digging her out she was all good and stuff but you could feel the the tension and stuff and, and also I shared with her um, a video from uh, Ariana Tricomi like who was in Austria and like witnessed um, a, a fatal accident uh, on an avalanche and, and she was talking about it in a really uh, touching way and uh, I think I think it is our responsibility to show more of that content to make people understand, so that later on when they have to take that decision of turning back, like John was saying, that they have uh, something in mind, an image where they can you know put in front of yeah. the like the good cool what they see below them. They put that image in, image in front, and they can weigh both a bit, and and it's easier to to just take the decision of turning back, because I think yeah that decision is just uh it's just so painful to take but but so mandatory and um yeah like very often i i get asked like how many how often like do you turn back and and like personally it's like very 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 regularly and 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 a lot of people don't realize that uh yeah Anyway, sorry. <laughs> no, it's good, man. It's good stuff. David, did you want to say something? You... Uh, y y yes, there is a question about um, ABS airbags. Someone asked, can you talk about the benefit of an ABS airbag? And I thought it's an interesting question because I see people relying a lot on the gear. It makes them feel safe. So someone can ask, the, uh, tell us about the benefits, but also the, the problems, you know, of the ABS. <clears throat> Sasha, do you want to share your opinion on that one? Well, I, I think ABS give you more confidence, for sure. Um, I think we saw a change when, when they came out. Uh, people feel safer, and they are safer with ABS. And uh, uh, as Xavier said before, a lot of people 
get along with avalanches. The week where all these accidents happen, I have a friend uh, working for Air Glacier as a rescue. That week, 147 people got concerned by an avalanche. 147. How many people died? Not so many. So if you consider the amount of people who've been taken or involved in an avalanche that week, meaning 147 had to be rescued, there's not a lot of people dead. And I think airbag works. And, and I think that gives people more confidence. Is it good or bad? I think, I think it's, it can be a long discussion about it, but for sure, I feel safer with an airbag. I yeah. do. I really do. So I, you, I, I, right. I probably ski some stuff sometimes less questioning myself with the airbag than if, if I had no airbag, I think. Yeah. Add, so it gives you that add, add another thing, you know, to, to your, your confidence. It yeah. does. It does. Sadly, it does. Does, it, does everybody ride with airbags? No. You don't. I don't. What's what's your reasoning behind that, John? Is it too heavy or your salt cool? Um, <laughs> it, it's it's a, it's a very. I, I agree with what uh, Sash said um, about the airbags. The, the the airbags. I think people have got to understand is not a total guarantee. It definitely raises your chances of riding out an avalanche because the airbag makes you lighter and you you stay on the surface. Except if you get caught in a little flat area where the snow can keep coming down on top of you that's uh you know one of the things or if or if you get slapped into the rocks um for me i i grew up without it uh i skied most of my um i've skied i won't say i've skied every line possible in verbia but i've skied most of them um without it and I've always been scared as Xavier is. Uh, I've got a huge respect from the mountains. I come from very flat country in Australia um, and I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed by the mountains on a daily basis. Um, I know a few guides who choose not to wear the airbags, not a lot, but a few of them who, who choose not to. Most of them are of my generation. Um, and I think it's, uh, I just feel that I've got, I need to be able to make the, the appropriate decisions for the situation uh, where that decision shouldn't be influenced by an airbag, I guess is the only way I can say it. And I'm not saying that I'm right. I think that having an airbag is a very good thing for many people that I choose to run my day in such a way. And I ski, um, I ski all over the place, um, and, but I choose my moments. Xavier, you, you use an airbag, do you, I guess? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use, um, I use an airbag all the time. And I feel actually a bit naked without it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky question for sure. Uh, yeah. Because like, of course, when you use it, you need to, to really always remind yourself that it's going to help you only in certain cases, you know, and not all the time. And um, yeah, it adds more chances, uh, mm -hmm. like for you to get other things. But uh, yeah, I think uh, for me, I, yeah, I, I definitely recommend it. But uh, yeah, the tricky part of it is to just get it and just think that you're going to be safe with it. And I think this is very often the limitation uh, of the system. But uh, yeah, if you think like this, then uh, like, why would you use a transceiver as well? You know, like, you know, it takes a while for people to to getting used to to a, to a technology and, and to know how to use it properly. And I think now that we've gone a bit through the phase where people just got them and just felt safe, I think now slowly people are getting a bit uh, more educated. I hope, but uh, yeah, for me on a personal level, um, I kind of don't write any powder without it. Yeah. Okay. Normally, like ninety percent. Yeah. <clears throat> um, David, any more questions out there that you want to 
Yeah, I need to select. Um, Mario <laughs> is asking if the orientation of the faces is crucial in the avalanche danger and if the hour has an impact on the avalanche danger and is it more dangerous in the morning or the afternoon? John, do you want to take that one? Um, absolutely, yes. Um, I think generally it's better to ride um, in the mornings. Um, it, it, much of it is temperature related uh, as well. Um, but there's, if you go if you go skiing around the mountain and you come down Marlena, you'll notice that. Uh, it forms crust and becomes crusty. The snow changes very quickly. If you go into the north facing uh, areas, the snow stays uh, more powdery. Um, depending on the time of the season in uh, December, January, it, it can be one situation, but by the time you get to the springtime, it's another, that's a, it's a, it's a very broad, broad question, but yes, the exposure definitely does have an effect. Thank you. Sasha, you said something earlier about um, when you first started skiing, you didn't used to start skiing in uh, December and January. Please. Mm, no, no, I said at the time when, when, when they didn't have any transceiver or ABS or whatever, off-piece season was starting mid-March when the sun was raising and you can actually, it stabilized a lot of the northern exposure slopes because actually when you look at the, at the, um, accident most of the accident happen on the on the northern exposure seems to northwest to northeast that's where the most avalanche happen in in the in a season because as john said on the southern exposure the sun actually uh, stabilize the snow uh, every day and at the time people were kind of of doing a off piece season very late very late in the season and that because it's actually safer you just have to you look more at the temperature in March, April, like you go in the morning, but they were not riding so much uh, steep stuff in, in December, January. And now it's, it's, it's something a bit new for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, since the evolution of, of, uh, of uh, fat skis and snowboards it changed the shape of the mountain. Yeah. yeah I, I'd say before when uh, it was uh, skinny skis, um, in order just to get to the point where you could ski a lot of those things, you already had to be pretty strong skier. Now the mountain is a lot more accessible due to the material uh, to a lot more people who have, you know, lots of uh, desire to get out there, but they have um, perhaps less experience, which is putting them at a, at a bit of a disadvantage. They, they don't perhaps understand the subtleties. Yeah, but maybe now also like with that aspect, a lot of people ski things all the time so at the same time like to see the the positive side of it, it it stabilizes a lot like everything so so it's kind of crazy how it changes a bit the mindset because like when you ride verbi all the time you used to ski stuff that is being ridden all the time even during the storm and uh and and so then you get used to a certain stability of the snow but then whenever you go outside of the resort then it's going to be a completely different game. And I think, um, yeah, I think this is a bit of a tricky one. Like I, I often uh, find when there is a very stable season, I'm always scared for the following season because I know that people are going to be so used to that stability. And then whenever it's going to become normal again. So when I say normal is like dangerous, then uh, yeah, they will be just reacting in the same way that they were reacting the season before when everything was so stable. And um, yeah, um, always, um, yeah, it mm. becomes a bit tricky. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think the, the Verbier uh, area is so huge, you know, when you look at the, for me, I look at Verbier as, you know, the whole domain is, you know, from here to the, the, for the end of the four valleys. And there's certain parts that are, frequented and get skier compacted as you say um and that that definitely has one set of rules but then you go over towards the plan de fou or you go into the you know the champ ferry hidden valley area or you go over the back towards mash and stuff like that suddenly you're getting into an area where the line is a lot more delicate so that's where your awareness levels need to be high but you're totally right that there's certain areas that you know within the center 
the heart of the station, which get hammered. Um, and so one set of rules applies there, but perhaps uh, even when you go into Valandabi, which gets skied a lot, but there's lines within Valandabi that are delicate. So talking about uh, delicate lines, uh, we have uh, people asking what basically what they can write now. I have um, people asking uh, with the conditions this season, are slopes below 30 degrees also tricky? Another one asking the same question, should I feel safe on slope under 30 degrees or do they slide as well? Uh, I have also people asking about the conditions in La Mousse, uh, in um, La Mouche. So I guess uh, maybe it would be interesting to know um, what's your take on what is safe-ish to ride at the moment or if there should be no riding off piste? I think it's very difficult for the guys to comment on that because things are changing all the time. Yeah. Um, but maybe they have something to add no, but under 30 degrees, you don't take, take much risk for sure. Huh? Mm. Nothing's on moving. <laughs> yeah. Have energy, don't, don't go down under 30 degrees. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, you're safe. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think you've also got to be aware of what's above you. Yeah, you know, exactly. I mean, you can, you can be riding on a 30 degree slope and be totally happy and somebody drops in from above you and, uh, you know, on a 45 degree slope and sets something running, you know. So yeah. your, your, your awareness of where you are, your awareness of where other people is crucial uh, in every day that you're out there and your responsibility uh, as the person who is higher up on the mountain to the people who are lower down in the mountain is also something that needs to be taken into consideration. And if you're about to ski something, you see another group coming in right behind you, you say, please wait until I'm out of the line. You know, you, you are allowed to talk to people. How is the sand affecting the snowpack is a question that keeps coming back. Sasha, you, do you want to mention that? You, you've already talked a little bit about it. The, 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 the sand, the problem of the sand is something that it, when you have sand on snow, the, 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 the layer or the fresh snow is going to come after the sand, never going to go with the sand, make, make something solid, never, for the whole season. It will stay fragile all season. So actually what happened uh, yesterday or two days ago, yesterday, I don't remember, um, was very bad for the rest of the season for sure. It's going to be a big problem this year until the end. It's, it's going to be some, another, it, it's, it's going to be a shitty year. <laughs> it, it, it started, yeah, the beginning was shitty, and I think it, it's going to be shitty for a while. <laughs> well said. <laughs> now, <laughs> sadly. And, and the sun is actually everywhere, I think. It, it came like in, um, in uh, unusual uh, quantity, and it came uh, everywhere. So it's going, to be a, it's going to be a problem, I think, yeah, for the rest of the season. Mm. Another problem. Uh, Sasha, since you're talking, someone uh, wanted to ask a question directly to you. Um, someone asked, can you quickly re-mention what you said about the rain stabilizing the snowpack? Do you think it meant the snowpack isothermal below where the rain line was? No, the, 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 actually when it rains on the snow, the, the, usually the, the moisture went, goes down to the ground almost. So, and then when it freezes again on, on after that, suddenly the all the all snow get together and and you lose those fragile uh, layer it it suddenly makes something solid that's what the rain is sometimes it's good and if you have high temperature at the beginning when it starts to snow it's always better because actually when it's a bit humid it it helps the snow to 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 get together with the with the ancient layer that's why it's 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 good but only when suddenly it gets colder after when it's hot and it's raining, it's really dangerous because you can really often see a high avalanche danger because the temperature are, are really hot or it's raining. Turning in, in a couple of days, it can suddenly go down to level two because it, it freezes again. Like today, for example, in the, the right side of the Valley du Rhône, it's, it's on level two already. Hmm. So it, it can change pretty quickly from, from very high avalanche danger to quite low. David, is there any more questions? I feel like we're coming to a, a I like here. It's already um, half an hour over the schedule. Andre, did you want to say something? 
Yeah, I just want to quickly catch up on the the sand on the snow thing before, just to keep it like very simple. I think if you imagine like, I mean, I'm a, I'm a carpenter, so like if you imagine like gluing two pieces of wood together with glue, it always says like the surface has to be fat and dust free uh, to to stick together. So imagine like that's the sand is just the dust between. So like it's 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 not there. It's not gluing together. And I think that's a really simple way to, to understand it. Nice. Um, guys, does anybody have anything else they want to mention um, before we kind of uh, come to an, an end for this session? Enjoy yourself. Look after yourself and look after each other. Not only those who are in your group, the people above you, the people below you. Nice. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, Sasha, any, any final words of wisdom? Yeah, just uh, respect, respect, respect yourself, respect the other, respect the mountain, and and then and, and take your time. Take your time when you go riding. Take your time. Mm -hmm. It's it's we we're living in a in a in in a world where everything's fast. We want to be the first. We want to we want to enjoy things, but time is is very important when you're in the mountain, and and, in it, and you can get a lot of things out out when you when you when you take time to think and and realize what you're doing mm -hmm. thank you it helps a lot uh, andre any uh any no, i just uh, agree with sasha like it's exactly take your time in, and then like also you enjoy your run you know it's like it's simple yeah. and um and xavier thank you for sharing tonight um have you got any final comments you've said a lot already mate to be honest <laughs> Uh, you're, you're, on, you're on mute. Sorry, sorry. No, yeah, yeah, no, it's been, uh, it's been very interesting. No, it's, it's such a broad subject, like the whole, uh, like, snow aspect, you know, it's like something which has so many sides to it, so many little uh, tricky parts, which is, uh, like, so, like, which depends so much on the way you're going to interpret it in terms of uh, your skills, the way you your personality is the luck you have the people you're with i don't know it's just a uh, basically an endless quest and uh, yeah i think it's um yeah like time has been uh, really coming up a lot in those last words and i yeah like it's kind of along these lines that i want to say that yeah we always say that the mountain will always be there and it's something uh, you know it's a bit of a cliche phrase but it's nice to try to experience that and to uh, to to force yourself to put that sentence into a uh, um, into application, and you will realize actually over time that you get to do amazing things, but without just forcing it and forcing it, like just by letting things happen by like when they're meant to happen. And um, yeah, I don't know. Brilliant. Wise words, wise words, but yeah, just mm -hmm. be clever, smart, be lucky, and take margin, a lot of margin always. Yeah. Thank you. Great words, great wise, wise words. Um, David, any any final comments? <laughs> well, just be safe, guys. Uh, no jump, no line is worth dying for it. Um, have a lot of fun, uh, but try to keep the maximum chances uh, on your side. Um, it's um, I see a lot the send it culture, but I think what is cooler than send it is uh, land it. And uh, I'd rather say some safe people that take it one step below than some big senders that I meet for three years and then they're dead. So yeah. stay on the on the safe side. Okay, thanks, man. Thank you to everybody. I think um, it's it's been a really interesting discussion. From and thank you for all sharing your your knowledge and your your experiences. Um, it looks like pretty much everyone has stayed for the whole meeting, which is which is a sign that it has been very interesting. So thank you guys, um, it's really appreciated. Finally, thank you again for everybody who's um, been on the panel. It's been really great to listen to all your stories and your experiences. And thank you everybody for joining. Um, it's one step and it's one really good step in the right direction to, to listen and to, to learn from, from others. So brilliant guys, thank you. And um, I hope to see you all soon and to stay safe. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Oh, guys, thank you. Bye. Thank you.